Okay, it's three o'clock, so I think we'll make a start. Welcome everybody. I'm told that there's over a thousand people signed up for the webinar, and I um, also know that we're streaming live on Facebook. So I hope uh, there are many people there having an opportunity to listen in, but there will be a link available afterwards. So if you're only able to join for part of the session, or you want to watch it afterwards, or you want to share it with somebody, then we'll make sure that's available for you. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sonia Chaudhry. I'm Chief Executive of Action for ME, but I'm also the Chair of the Management Group for the Decode ME Study, working alongside Chris and Andy, who sends his apologies today. And as a management group, we're responsible for overseeing the study, but we very much work in partnership with all of our colleagues uh, within the team. There are just far too many of them to, to name, but I have to say they're a fantastic team to, to work with. So the things that we're telling you about today are very much down to the team and not just Chris and myself. So you'll hear from me a little bit later and we'll also have a Q&A session, but I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to tell you a bit about the work we've been doing in the background. It's been quite some time now, but it's been a huge amount of work and what's coming up. And then we'll tell you a bit about the way in which we're involving people with ME before the Q&A. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Sonia. So yes, my name is Chris Ponting. I'm a human geneticist at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides um, just so that we can uh, update you on, on where we are uh, with uh, Decode ME. Um, so yes, Decode ME is the world's largest study of the causes of ME CFS. Um, Quick reminder, I've shown these slides before in the previous webinar. Um, it's a five-step procedure how people can participate. And um, the questionnaire that you will be asked to complete is, is one that you can do from home. And we're trying to recruit uh, up to 20,000 people um, with ME in the UK who pass uh, the criteria. Um, people who are 16 years plus um, of different uh, experiences, mild, moderate, severe, um, ME, all, all fine. Um, so you, you can, on your computer, you can fill in um, the, the questionnaire or we, um, if you're unable to do that, we, we are also trialing a, a paper questionnaire and um, the results of all of that will come to us at the University of Edinburgh. Um, step two, we will, for those people who, who pass our criteria, step two, we will send you a saliva collection kit um, and you will be able to provide your saliva um, and put it in um, a, an envelope, put it in the regular post, and that will go to Milton Keynes, the biocenter there in, in Milton Keynes, who will extract the DNA from the saliva samples. Step three, they'll send one half of your DNA sample to California to do the DNA analysis via Thermo Fisher Scientific. The other half will be uh, kept in Milton Keynes um, in storage for hopefully in the future whole genome sequencing. Um, the data from California will come back to us in, in Edinburgh. Um, and we will then do the, in step five, the last step, the DNA data analysis, trying to find out which DNA letters are more in people with ME than in UK controls. And we're taking the existing data for up to half a million people from up and down the UK, which is why in our first step, we're focusing on um, uh, having participants from the UK only. So where are we? I must say this project is far greater than I had ever anticipated. For example, we put in our ethics application and we received a favorable opinion. It's been passed by the uh, ethics committee. For that, we produced 14 documents, in total 103 pages that have passed by patient public involvement, individuals passed by all of us. Um, and we, we produced many versions of these documents. So that was a huge success. Um, and it, it took several months to get to that point. So that was milestone one. 
We've been rattling our way through the other milestones, looking at um, uh, organizing the DNA collection kit, the questionnaires, the, including the paper questionnaire, ensuring our data management schema is uh, secure, um, making sure the recruitment is in place and all of our implementation is in place. And we're at the stage in the pre-launch stage at the moment. So what's next? We've got a whole variety of, of different things um, that we, we have in the next few weeks to, uh, to finalize. And we hope to do all of those things by the end of next month. Um, I'm, I'm not telling you a, a date because we have to make sure that we are 100% ready. This is such an important project for us all. We should not launch until we're absolutely certain that we've got everything in place. Now, I gave you a quick preview of it just now. Breaking news. Um, you all know that uh, there have been many people affected by um, the COVID-19 virus in the UK. And unfortunately, so many people of those are expected to meet ME uh, CFS criteria. And so when we first appreciated um, and planned this uh, project, of course, COVID was not on the horizon. But given that we're now in the COVID-19 world, we have reacted uh, to it. And we asked the uh, funders whether we could add to our existing project. And they have very recently agreed. We will keep all of our plans in place to recruit 20,000 people who received a diagnosis of ME before COVID. None of that will change. But now what we've done is add the possibility of recruiting up to 5,000 people who will be diagnosed with ME because of having the COVID virus. Um, and, uh, and that is therefore will enable us to say whether the genetic signal um, that might explain ME for pre-COVID is in some sense similar to the genetic signal that might explain some people with ME post-COVID. So this will be the landing page. This is what you will see when you, uh, you, you are asked to uh, fully participate in, in the study. So over to uh, Sonia, who will tell you something more about uh, PPI. Thank you, Chris. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got quite a big team and uh, patient and public involvement or PPI is at the very heart of everything that we do. We have people from the ME community involved in every delivery team in the management group. And we have a number of people that are acting as advisors and over 300 people that are working with us as social media ambassadors. And you are still able to join us as a social media ambassador if you'd like. And there'll be more information about that uh, through social media or you can contact the team itself. So every single thing that Chris has talked about and just outlined, we've had PPI in. And many of you will have heard about involvement from people with ME through other projects where maybe people are asked to consult on a leaflet, maybe asked to give a view on something. What we have done is to make sure that from the very start, from the application itself, at every single stage, people have had a say on what we do, how we do it and why we're doing it. So just some examples. Chris mentioned the ethics submission over 103 or 103 pages. All of our PPI team fed in in some way to that document. We know that people with ME are, um, have um, their own health issues. Some individuals, carers, uh, obviously have responsibilities. And so we have had to adapt what we do and how we do it. And at times we've had to slow things down because we felt it's really important that we were as inclusive as possible. And that really enables us to be transparent in what we're doing. We want uh, people to be aware of what we're doing, which is why we're holding Q&As and sharing lots of information. 
We want people to understand why we're making certain decisions and we want to make sure that people with ME in our team are at the heart of those decisions. And um, we regularly check in with our PPI colleagues to make sure that it's working well. We um, just some examples aside from the ethics submission. I hope that many of you will have, many of you will have seen our website, the branding, the design, the content, the wording, all of that has been developed uh, with people with ME. They have contributed, our colleagues have contributed to written content. We've, had, we've got um, various forms, various leaflets, and a really good suggestion in the last week or two from a couple of our PPI colleagues who said, actually, to make uh, it more accessible for people, we don't want just written information. We would like a voiceover recording so that people can listen to that. And that is something that we're going to spend money on to make sure that we can produce that. Our recruitment plans were developed um, following a consultation. Lots of you will have contributed ideas and the recruitment plan itself has been developed significantly with people with ME. We've got the portal, which is uh, the where you'll go to input your data. That has been developed and tested with our PPI colleagues and also decisions around the extension to the project that Chris just talked about, our collaboration with Solve, et cetera, all of those decisions have been made with our PPI colleagues. And the impact that that has had is making our study much more accessible, much more transparent. We've had much better engagement with the ME community, and we know that there's still more to, to do there. And hopefully that will have a huge impact in our recruitment numbers. So if you are over 16, based in the UK and have had a diagnosis of ME, then potentially you will be able to participate in our study. And if you haven't signed up already, then you can go to the website and um, sign up for updates. You'll be first in line when we open full recruitment and we'll be able to participate then. Not everybody that signs up and actually um, goes through all the questions will meet the specific criteria that we have. Research projects have to have very specific criteria. And if you don't meet that criteria, it doesn't mean that you don't have ME, it just means that your data for this particular project um, can't be used. However, it can still be held with your consent, it can contribute to other research, and you will be able to access all of the wonderful things that the Solve Registry and app offer. And we're working through all those technical things at the moment. So I'd just like to finish off with a quote. Um, the next slide has a lot of words on it. Please don't worry about reading it, I will read it out. But I wanted to make sure that I got the wording exactly right, because this is from one of our PPI colleagues who asked me to read it rather than be, her, be here today. I'm in a Facebook group for another condition where there's a research study underway into part of that condition. The research team had outsourced the final questionnaire, meaning that some of the questions weren't completely appropriate but you couldn't skip them or mark them as not applicable. There was no never option. The least you could answer was rarely. The person who had received the questionnaire felt it was unfit for purpose, and it made them feel angry that the answers they were forced to give due to the bad design would result in bad data. It made me feel even more grateful that the involvement of PPI in the design of the Decode ME study has ensured that our questionnaires and all communication are fit for purpose for people with ME. Because we know the disease inside out and our PPI group covers all severities of ME, either directly or via the community, we have always had the participation, participants' limitations and needs at the heart of every aspect of what we do. It's important that with people with ME not only know, but also feel that those involved in the study understand their condition and that we are listening to what they need in order to participate. It made me realise once again just how positive the PPI steering group is in terms of impact on the study. So thank you very much to our colleague that um, prepared that for us. Uh, we've got lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, we've had some questions in advance. I would like to say that about 70% of the questions we received in advance were about ME and people's experiences and need for support. 
So I make no apology for not including those today because we're talking specifically about the DECODE ME study. But please, if you do need support, you can come to Action for ME or ME Association or any of the other charities. And we will consider whether there's something we can do separately from the DECODE ME study to be able to take questions like that. So um, we'll, we'll come back to you if that's going to be possible. So I'm going to start off with a question, Chris. I would like to ask how open the NHS and clinical commissioning groups are to looking at the data that is collected during the study and how this will be used for any patients going forward. So thank you, Sonia. So yes, you can opt in or not opt in as you wish to let us um, receive data from the NHS from your medical records um, for decode ME only. We won't share any personal details that might identify you or any of your health data. So the genetic information that, that we'll uh, collect uh, it is not really usable by the NHS at this moment. Um, so the value instead will come from aggregating um, DNA information from you know, the 20,000 or 25,000 people um, and we hope that that aggregated information will reveal genetic causes of ME rather than being relevant to individuals. Thank you, Chris. And I'll answer the next question. Will there be anyone available to ring people and fill in the questionnaire by phone? As I mentioned, we really want people with more severe, very severe ME to be able to participate if they can. And we, we know that whatever we do may not be enough for some people, but we have commissioned um, Helen Baxter from the 25% group to work with us so that if people have nobody to assist them in filling in the questionnaire or they're not able to do it themselves and we will make paper copies available, then there will be a number that you can ring to speak to somebody who's very experienced and knowledgeable about working alongside people with severe ME and Helen will be able to help you fill in the, the questionnaire. So Chris, uh, we've got another question. Is Epstein-Barr virus on the questionnaire? Um, I don't believe it is. And there are so many different questions that uh, we could have asked. Um, but in this initial questionnaire, we chose not to, to keep the questionnaire to a reasonable length. Um, but we will be coming back to all participants to ask them further questions and subsequent uh, questionnaires. Um, and we hope to therefore continue to um, uh, to generate value um, from the large cohort. Right, and an another question sort of slightly linked to that, is the study open to fibromyalgia sufferers to see what if difference there is? If people have uh, an, a diagnosis of ME and fibromyalgia, absolutely. Um, if people have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia but not ME, um, then they perhaps would be more appropriate for other uh, projects which are ongoing. Um, but we are not losing sight of the fact that there is um, uh, overlap between a whole variety of conditions. And um, in our analysis phase, we will be comparing the different uh, genetic signals for overlapping disorders to see if there is um, any causal element that comes from your genes that predispose to one or the other or both. Thank you. And I'll, I'll pick up the next question. Is this a new questionnaire or might I have already filled it in? I put my name forward a long time ago. We do, do appreciate that there has been quite a gap for all the reasons that Chris explained. Lots and lots and lots to do to make sure that, the, um, that we've got the quality of um, so get the quality there, that we've got all the processes in place, etc., and that we've done it um, at a, a kind of rate of work that is acceptable and accessible for, for everybody. So you haven't already filled in a questionnaire. These questionnaires, the questionnaire you need to fill in to participate will be available when we launch the full recruitment. And if you have signed up for updates, then we will make sure that you are first in line to be able to do that. And that links with another question that um, somebody has asked. You have over 26,000 people now registered. If I sign up, will I still get to participate? 
Well, it's a great question. We um, would love to be able to take as many people as possible. And we are feeling much more confident that we will hit our 20,000 and now 25,000 if we include the extension. But as I mentioned earlier, not everybody will meet the very specific criteria that we're using for this research project. So we do need a lot more than 20,000 people. And we will make sure that those who are only able to answer, um, fill in the questionnaire with support via the phone line, that we have space for, for those individuals as well. And we're working through how we do that currently. So Chris, I'm going to ask you um, a question here. Will there be any sharing or comparison of data between COVID-19 studies as some of the long COVID symptoms seem similar to ME? So we've reached out to um, the other studies that are ongoing. Um, so React Long COVID, for example, um, and there's another study uh, that is being led out of Sano Genetics. So we are um, in dialogue, essentially. They know of us, we know of them. Um, and when we have the data in place, then um, absolutely we will um, ensure that uh, where there is value, then that will be um, extracted for comparison to see what are the similarities and dissimilarities. Thank you. And there's another question about the questionnaire. So how can I access and complete your online questionnaire? Just to say it's not available yet. When, when we launch recruitment, uh, which we hope will be at the end of September, around um, September sometime, then we will make sure that we, uh, we let everybody know this, as far and wide as we possibly can through the, right through the ME support group, social media, the charities, et cetera. We are also working with um, uh, some press colleagues to make sure that we get some press coverage so that we can reach people that maybe we're not already connected with. There's a question here around, to get, is it, it is difficult to get a formal diagnosis of ME. So is this going to hinder the, the study? I think we've just talked about the numbers of people that we've already got signed up. So we hope that that won't hinder it. But what I will say is Action for ME, ME Association, other charities are there to support you in helping you get a diagnosis or at least um, your symptoms considered by a doctor. So you can contact our information support and advocacy service for example, or one of the other charities who may offer similar support. So Chris, um, this is a question from somebody who's thanking us for the work on this exciting project. And they just wondered whether you could give us some idea of when the findings from this research are likely to be available. Oh my goodness. So um, I, I don't want to give anyone a particular date because, as I said earlier, um, we'll only do things when we're absolutely ready for them. If we, as we very much hope, um, we are able to recruit people exceptionally rapidly and uh, of the number that we require, 20,000, 25,000, um, it will still take time for the DNA to be read out. Um, that is not weeks, but months. Um, and once we have the data, it unfortunately will take time um, to do the proper analysis so that we don't come forward with false conclusions. Now, when um, I was a very minor participant in the COVID-19 genetic study, um, that was done to a very high level and it took uh, probably three months to do. So I, if everything goes well, we've got a, um, a, a huge upswelling of support from um, everyone out in the community, which is marvelous. If everything goes well, I am hopeful that um, by the end of the second year of this project, which is 12 months from now, we'll have some initial findings. Thank you. And Chris, will the involvement of people with long COVID mean that those with ME will end up as Cinderella again? So um, I, what we're not doing is um, inviting people with all people with long COVID into this study. What we are doing is saying that there will be some people with um, a diagnosis of ME-CFS because of the COVID-19 virus. Um, and we don't want to exclude them and nor do we want to um, um, 
sort of reduce the influence of people who have had ME for a very long time before COVID-19. I think where this question is coming from is entirely justified, that the amount of money that um, funders spend on ME is tiny compared to what is being spent on long COVID. Um, I think that is a deplorable situation, that's my personal view, um, and we will, of course, do everything we can to put forward excellent scientific uh, projects and programs um, and support anyone to do that in the UK and abroad to make sure that um, ME is not a Cinderella in the future as it is today. Thank you, Chris. And I'm just going to pick up a few questions all together. Um, there's lots of information at www.decodeme.org.uk. A uh, question about the funders. So this project is being jointly funded by the Medical Research Council, the MRC, and the National Institute for Health Research, NIHR. So they are our two funders. And um, all of that information is on the website. More questions about, I've signed up for updates to the website. Am I participating in the study? We have not yet opened the re recruitment. So you haven't yet participated. We will let you know when that's open. Those people that have signed up have signed up for updates. And because you've done that, we will tell you when it opens first. So you will be first in line to be able to participate. Chris, I've got a question here about severe ME. I recently took part in a study for migraine, which had the same saliva test. I found it extremely exhausting doing the test. And I'm very concerned that those with very severe ME would find it too difficult. Would it be possible to do the test over a longer period of time, e.g. over a day or several days, or does it need to be done in one go? So, first of all, I'm, I'm just sorry that providing a saliva sample is so difficult for you. Um, uh, so, we, we'll ask everyone to try their best to give enough sample in one go. But really, if, if that isn't possible, um, no worries. Uh, come back, keep trying. Now. I, I'll need to check on this, but I think providing your sample in the same tube, um, having several goes, it is going, it's still going to work. Um, and even if it doesn't, we'll send you another sample kit so you can try again. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to try and pull a few questions to, together here, Chris. Um, so the first one is, what is the focus area of this particular study on ME? There may be um, a little bit more about what we're doing, the genetic testing that we're doing. Second question is, are you going to perform a complete DNA sequence of all the participants' uh, DNA? And then the third question is, is this the first research of its kind for MECFS? Okay, thank you, Sonia. I'll try and remember all those, those questions. So the first one really is, what is the main question? What are we doing? Um, it, it, what we're not doing is a genetic test, which in the health service is testing for something that is known that predisposes people to a disease. Here, we're trying to discover what are the genetic differences that predispose people to ME. Um, so the, the major question is, is there genetic predisposition to ME, which is written into your DNA uh, via you know, common DNA letter changes. So, and then once we find the genetic signals and that will tell us what commonly goes wrong in, in people uh, diagnosed with ME. And that's important, we think, the funders think, because only then can scientists can take um, an evidence-based approach to deciding what to do next, what experiments to do, whether to study in the immune system or mitochondria or the neuro nervous system or, or whatever. Now, what was the second thing? Um, you're going to have to help me out, Sonia. Uh, hi, and are you going to perform a complete DNA sequence of all oh, the participants' you. DNA? You put me on the spot there too. Yeah, well, you put me on the spot too. <laughs> um, we wish, we had hoped to do that. Um, we had asked funders to do this for a small number of people. Um, that didn't come through. Um, we will keep a sample from everyone who, who consents, obviously, um, to allow that to happen. What we, we are doing is looking at the DNA letters at 800,000 places in your genomes, which are commonly different among people, and, and looking at whether those common differences 
predict whether someone has ME or not. Um, and that is the cheapest way and the most powerful way uh, per pound um, for, to finding out what are the genetic signals in a disease. Um, so thank you for that, that question. And the third one I've also forgotten. Uh, is, is, is this the first research of its kind? It's not the any? first. Um, it's the only one that would ever work. The previous ones would never work because there have never been enough people in the studies. And we know that because we've uh, looked to see whether previous results have uh, replicated in, in a larger sample of UK biobank, and they haven't. Um, so that means that we only now have a chance of finding DNA signals because of the very large numbers of people that we hope are, are, are going to register. So the, the success of Decode ME is not down to our hard work, which we're putting in. It's down to whether sufficient numbers of people register. Thank you. And Chris, um, we've got a, a question here from somebody uh, who's not in the UK. Why is it not possible to include participants from abroad? Because I'd love to, to be involved and to participate. And, and I, I would love to include everyone who, who is um, eligible. Unfortunately, we didn't want to spend our money on um, doing the genetics of healthy people. And we need the genetics of healthy people to contr as controls to compare against the people with ME. And we needed very large numbers of um, people who are healthy controls. Um, to, to compare against. And so the obvious way for us to do that is to use existing data, the up to half a million people who have participated in the UK biobank, in the UK. And we have to, to match the people with ME against those controls. And because the controls come from UK, we've had to, in the initial stages anyway, focus on people with ME who come from the UK. Um, I'm not um, uh, in any way saying that people outside the UK will not be asked at some point, but at the, our initial um, request is for people in the UK to, to register. We've had a question um, from somebody who says they've had severe ME over the last 20 years and have been bed or housebound for much of that time. In the last two to three years, um, they've improved dramatically and can walk two miles or so now. Should I still volunteer for the study? I, I would love it if that person were to register. If you anyone has had a, a diagnosis of, of ME and fulfilled the criteria, you are very welcome to be a participant. Um, question around the NHS. Will you be applying for NHS ethical approval, which would mean NHS clinics could help you recruit participants? Um, so we haven't in our ethics approval asked for that to happen. Um, we took a view that the, the large numbers of people that we need for this study um, would be more efficiently and cost effectively uh, recruited via um, these approaches, via um, social media and, and traditional media approaches and via your networks um, than in, in clinical um, uh, situations. Um, and I think uh, the, the numbers that have already pre-registered uh, bear witness to that, the, the success of that approach. Um, we've had a question that came in in advance, which was asking, could we go and talk to the to a support group. We absolutely will come and talk to support groups. Um, our colleague Sam, who is off, off his camera at the moment and working away in the background, is working with the team to look at uh, contacting support groups, arranging talks. We might have to do it um, in, in groups and groups together just because there are a lot of local support groups and it would take quite a lot of time getting around all of them, but we do have a plan in place there and that has been informed through our engagement with support groups, but also with our PPI colleagues. We've got quite a few questions, Chris, around um, uh, uh, data samples and data security. And so could you just tell us a little bit about um, how, we, uh, how we will anonymize the DNA samples, how we ensure data security, those kinds of things? Um, so we take 
we take these issues incredibly seriously, right? So we'll store personal data. So these are things like your name, your contact details, the answers to the questionnaire. We store all of that data separately from your DNA data and from health record data if you opt in to use that. So we'll, instead of um, connecting to your name, et cetera, we'll connect to a code um, and that is called pseudo anonymization. Um, and so having a code instead means that scientists analyzing the data don't know who you are, don't know, won't be able to see the name, contact details or anything like that. And it's important to say that everyone working on the project has a legal duty to keep your personal information confidential. And University of Edinburgh has run these types of projects before. And we are on an almost daily basis now talking to legal teams in the university and the data protection officer about these issues, and we will get them right. Thank you. And um, could you just say a little bit, Chris, about uh, how we may or may not share data that we collect? So individual data, but also then what we want to do with other scientists and researchers in terms of the finding. Thank you. So, as I said, we won't share personal data. Um, once the, the name contact details have been separated from the, the questionnaire data, from the DNA data, then that could be shared. But we're not going to share with anyone except those who are bona fide researchers. Um, and we will not stand in the way of anyone around the world who is a bona fide researcher who wants to use the data for you know, good reasons. Um, and so uh, as is the best practice across such projects, we will have a data um, access committee who, who will be the management group. Um, so that's myself and Sonia and, and Andy. Um, and we will decide um, whether applications are, are you know, appropriate or not. Um, and this could be, people who are academics or people in industry, we don't make any um, restrictions there because we want um, industry to be involved as quickly as possible um, in the hope that they can produce good therapeutics to treat ME in as soon as possible. Thank you. And quite a few questions coming in around other conditions with overlap overlapping symptoms. How, do, how are we going to ensure that we don't contaminate the sample? How are we going to make sure that we really distinguish ME from other illnesses? And um, why aren't we including POTS and um, other post-infectious illnesses as part of this study? You touched on that before, but maybe you can just highlight that again, given the questions coming in. Yes, so on one hand, we have to have enough people. So we can't be too narrow in our definition. On the other hand, if we're too broad, then there is this issue about uh, heterogeneity, sort of other uh, types of conditions uh, creeping in. So to answer this, we've used international criteria to define what we mean by ME. Um, so the Canadian consensus, the IOM, to ensure that post-exertional malaise is the cardinal uh, symptom in tandem with a, um, a medical professional's diagnosis of of your ME. And we, we won't exclude people if you have a diagnosis of ME, if you also have another diagnosis, um, like fibromyalgia, as we talked about before. And we'll, but we will apply some exclusionary criteria, um, which has already been agreed with PPI, as Sonia's described, and the funders. Um, and this allows us to have enough people to have given the study sufficient power to find the genetic signal if it's there um, uh, without, we believe, um, encroaching on, on other genetic conditions. But I want to say one other thing. Once we get all of the data, we can compare the genetic signal of ME with a whole slew of other things. Everything that's been looked at using such approaches to determine whether there is an overlap in the genetic signal or not with other conditions. And then also split apart the, um, the cohort that we will put together in Decode ME um, to try and, and find uh, the differences that 
absolutely exist within that uh, cohort and see whether those differences are also um, evidence in the DNA data. Um, so it's just a start of a journey and we needed to start in a reasonable place. And I think we've, we've done that well. Thank you, Chris. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in that don't relate directly to this study. So just a reminder that you can contact Action for ME, ME Association, one of the other charities if you need specific support. And we've got a couple of questions, people wanting to link up with other people with ME. I don't want to stand biased, but I obviously know much more about Action for ME given I'm the chief executive there and we have online forums, but all the other charities provide excellent services. So you, there, there are things that are happening where you can join up with other people with, with ME. We've um, got some questions around how you sign up for updates. So you can do that through www.decodeme.org.uk. And there is a very, very short form that you fill in. And we will, once we've got your consent, we will send you regular updates and blogs and that kind of information. We will also tell you, you will be first in line to, to find out when when the study will open so that you can participate. If you can't use um, the if you can't use the online function, then we you are also able to phone the charities and with your consent details can be passed on and we have a list of people that if we have to we'll post things out. We try not to we try and encourage people to use their friends and carers to support but if you really do need us to post things out then we absolutely will. Chris we've got a question from somebody who says I'm too ill to go out to to post my saliva back. What will what will happen? Will it be collected? Um, so I think there, I'd, I'd need to check on this, but I think there there might be a service in the post office that will allow the raw mail that will allow um, collection. Um, we, we're we're not um, providing this as essential. Uh, aspect to all that we're doing in, in Decode ME because obviously we're wanting to um, to increase the numbers uh, rather than um, spending money on on making sure that uh, collection kits are, are picked up from every address so we we really hope that that people um, can draw upon um, friends and family to, to help with that um, uh, and I'm just very sorry if, if in some circumstances that means that people will feel that they're unable to, to participate. But once you've provided a saliva sample, it's, it's, um, it's neutralized. You can keep it for quite a while uh, until perhaps someone comes and visits who you can then ask to, to pop it in a post box. And um, last couple of questions, because we're starting to run out of time. We've got so many questions, so we will try and work through them and update our frequently asked questions on the website. So please do go there. There's lots of information that our PPI colleagues have helped us pull together. So uh, a lot of questions around the um, questionnaire and um, how will you know if um, I've got ME and I've been diagnosed with ME? Because obviously we've said you need to have been diagnosed with, with ME. How will you know? What will, how will the questionnaire help us address that? And is it okay if I got diagnosed 30 plus years ago? Of course, if you've been diagnosed 30 years ago, absolutely. Um, I think the, the key thing here is that we trust people to do the right thing. That if I meet someone and they tell me that they have ME and they've been diagnosed by a, a medical a professional, who am I to say otherwise? So that is our view. Um, I, I don't believe, and I hope I'm right in this, that, that there will be gaming of, of the questionnaire. That it's not what, this is such an important area of research uh, for affecting, afflicting so many people um, I would very much hope that um, people uh, are wanting to join us in prosecuting this project in the way that we do on a daily basis, which is with the utmost seriousness. Thank you. 
And we've got um, a series of questions around how much it would cost to do full DNA um, analysis, whole genome sequencing, etc. And so, and people asking if they can donate to make that happen. I will just share that Chris and um, Liz Worthy in the States are being funded through Action for ME and Solve, the US-based organization, to, undertake, to deliver a fellowship. And one of the things that we are looking at there is whole genome sequencing, and we will have to fundraise for that. So there will be information that will come out um, in, in due course. And several of the charities also fund research. So if you really wanted to make a donation, either to the work through the fellowship at a later stage or through one of the charities for research, then you can do. But we're not actively fundraising for this project because the funders have fully funded it um, at this, this stage. So we've just, we're just coming to the end now. I know that there's lots of questions. I'm so sorry if we didn't get to, to answer your question. Please be reassured that we will take them all away and see if we can update the frequently asked questions on our website. We will also do another webinar. Um, we'll look to get another date in the diary so that we can keep engaging with you, make sure that you have the information that you need. Don't forget to sign up uh, for updates because you will be first in line to be able to participate. Do tell people that you know that might be interested. You don't have to have ME to sign up for updates. If you just want to hear how, how the study is going and somebody asked a question, what if, I, what if I'm not eligible for the, the study, can I still get updates? Yes, you can, as long as you've signed up through our website or through contacting one of the charities, we will make sure that we keep you updated. And we just thank you very, very much for your time. I know many of you will have been preparing for this so that um, so that you can you can listen now or you may come back to it. We hope that it's worked using a Zoom webinar and on Facebook and that people will be able to listen via audio if you're not able to watch. So we hope that we've made that as accessible as possible. So we're now going to end the webinar and um, just on behalf of the whole of the Decode ME partnership, thank you very much. <laughs>